Okay. So we are going to get ourselves started here. Um, welcome everyone. We're so happy to have you today for our webinar, Ergonomics at Home, Positioning Yourself for Less Pain. Um, you know, we thought this was a really good topic, especially for right now, um, you know, given everyone being at home um, and, you know, pain worries, especially we're often at home anyway and on the computer, um, but perhaps even more so right now. So my name is Emily Lamiska, and I am Director of Communications and Educational Programming for US Pain. Um, and I'll be just welcoming you and um, going over some tips for using Zoom. Then we'll have our keynote presentation from Dr. Kusirk, which we're very excited about. Um, she's pretty fantastic and has a fantastic presentation lined up for us today. And then what everyone's excited about is always the question and answer session. So we will have some time to ask some questions um, and get some answers, which will be wonderful. And to ask those questions, um, well, first let's talk about, um, as you may have noticed, you are on mute and your cameras are off, um, but you can control your screen size and your view. So if you hover over your screen at the top right, there should be some options for um, going between either a gallery view or active speaker view. Um, you can also change the screen size. Um, like I said, written questions will be taken at the end. So please, um, if you think of a question, feel free to type it in, but just know we, we won't get to it um, until after uh, Linda's presentation. Um, and you can type questions in to the Q&A panel. And that button should be at the bottom of your screen. You should be able to see something that says Q&A. Um, and if you are having trouble finding that, um, you can also um, just maybe try raising your hand or um, try to get our attention some other way, but the Q&A should work. Um, so yeah, please get your questions ready. And just so you know, in case you have to jump off early for any reason, um, we do record all these webinars and we post them to our website um, so you can watch it in full if you need to leave early for some reason. So without further ado, I wanted to welcome Linda. Whoops. Um, and so Linda is a graduate of the University of Delaware Physical Therapy School. Um, she joined Seneca Physical Therapy in 1992, which is now Physical Therapy and Balance Centers of Rockville. She earned her doctorate from Shenandoah University in 2009. I also just realized I'm not sharing my video with you guys. So <laughs> sorry, here I am. Um, in addition to her background in orthopedic sports medicine and manual therapy, Dr. Kusirk has experienced treating patients with myofascial pain syndromes and chronic pain. She has had extensive training in the area of women's health and is an APTA certified pelvic floor therapist, treating both men and women with pelvic floor dysfunction and chronic pelvic pain. Her other areas of interest include TMJ and neural entrapment syndromes. Dr. Kusirk is the clinical education coordinator for clinical internships of graduate students at Physical. So she has a great range of expertise that's very specific to chronic pain. So we we're very lucky to have her um, to talk about ergonomics with us and to do so from a, you know, a chronic pain perspective. So um, with that, I would like to welcome Linda. Hey, Linda, if you're there and wanna turn on your screen. I will stop mine. Hello. There you <laughs> Thank are. You. Thank you for that lovely introduction. No okay. problem. I am going to share my screen. Okay. I'm going to turn off my video. So. Okay. So today we're going to talk about posture and ergonomics today. Okay. Um, yeah, I am currently working in Physical Therapy and Balance Center of Rockville, um, which is in Maryland. Um, I do see a lot of chronic pain patients um, and a lot of pelvic um, pain patients. We're going to talk a little bit about posture and ergonomics today. Um, posture is a person's position, like when their body and standing and sitting, 
Whereas ergonomics is applied science um, concerned with designing and arranging things so that people interact with their environment um, or their work area more efficiently and safely. So why do we do ergonomics? Why do we look at ergonomics? We wanna make people more comfortable when they work. We wanna prevent injury um, and we wanna keep people more efficient. So ergonomics helps with efficiency, but also helps with uh, reducing musculoskeletal injury. Okay, so risk factors for musculoskeletal disorders are awkward postures, excessive force, like pressure on a body part throughout the day, high repetition where you're doing the same activity over and over and over again, such as hammering or scanning um, the repetitive work. Contact stress where there is pressure on a body part as well, like where I'm leaning against the sharp edge of a desk pressing my wrists down against something and poor physical condition, All right? So this picture here is just looking at posture and sitting and standing and with a plumb line. So plumb lines are basically a string with a weight on the bottom and you hold it up and then you line up a person's bony landmarks and see where their posture falls. And we're just looking for those natural curves and their relationship um, in a neck. Oh, I can even move, I think, a little further maybe. Ah. So in our neck, we have what's called a lordosis, which is a little inward curve. We have a thoracic kyphosis, which is a little outward curve, and a lumbar lordosis, which is a little inward curve. Here we're looking at the ear, basically it's the shoulder, the acromion, and your hip bone. This is called a plumb line, and we're just looking at how a person, how much of their body's on one side versus the other side of a plumb line. It's kind of like physics. The more you're in front or behind something, the greater the forces are on your body in that area. In addition though to like spine alignment and position of spine, um, we also consider muscle strength and core muscles. So core muscles, I just put this in here because everybody talks about core. So basically your core is a cylinder of muscles. Okay, that's kind of inside your, you know, around your abdomen, the surface of your abdomen. It includes your diaphragm at the top, and your diaphragm is a sheet-like muscle. When you breathe in, your diaphragm drops down, lung, your lungs fill with air. When you exhale, your diaphragm comes up and your lungs send the air out. But your core is the diaphragm, your abdominal muscles, specifically the transversus abdominis, abdominis which is the deepest layer, and your pelvic floor, muscles on the bottom, and the multifidus, which are deep back muscles. So all these muscles work together to provide a solid base for your arms and legs and to work off of and your muscles to work off of and they also stabilize and control the pressure in the trunk. So muscle strength and spinal position all kind of come in to posture and ergonomics. All right so I'm going to talk a little bit first about the cervical spine and forward head posture. Um, so an average head weighs about 10 pounds, but for each inch that that head goes forward, it's about another 10 pounds of force, you know, on the muscles in your neck. So the more that your head goes forward, the harder your muscles have to work to hold things up. Um, when, thing, when muscles are chronically overloaded, what you tend to see is a tightening of soft tissue, okay, which in that tightening causes decreased blood flow, and then sometimes that can lead to pain. I included just a couple studies. These are more correlations. It's not a cause and effect. So I'm not saying because you have a forward head, you will have back pain, but we definitely see an increase in pain, the number of people with pain with, that, with forward head. So here are just two studies. And um, this first study found that the slump posture and sitting caused greater head and neck flexion, anterior translation of the head, so moving the head moves forward, and increased muscle activity in the cervical extensor. So the more that my head, I'm going to turn sideways, but the more that my head goes forward, the muscles down he, back here will tighten and they also have to work harder to support my head. Okay. The second study um, found that when people are in a corrected sitting posture, that they have less muscle activity in the neck. So the idea with posture is that my muscles are as close to as rest as they can be, so they don't have to work as hard. So the better my posture, the less my muscles have to work to hold me up, um, and a lot of times the better I feel, feel. I also included this 
slide. This is the forward head posture in texting. This is kind of a newer thing. <laughs> I have teenage or young adult boys now, and they're always looking down at their phone, but it just shows um, the force on your, that the muscles in your neck have to counteract at different positions. So again, at rest, normally, like with great posture, we have about a 10 pounds in our head. But as that tips forward and forward, when we get to that 60 degree angle, it's about 60 pounds of force my muscles are working to counteract, which may not necessarily cause pain, but if I already have pain in the area or weaker muscles, that may exacerbate some of my symptoms. Um, this was just one other study, the relationship between the forward head posture and neck pain. It was a systematic review, and it showed that Adults with neck pain had an increased forward head posture compared to asymptomatic adults. Again, it's not necessarily a cause and effect, but it's a correlation. Um, adolescents, it didn't seem to matter as much. All right, so some helpful hints for our necks. Um, when you're lying down to study or watch TV, try not to lie like flat in your bed with your head on multiple pillows. So a lot of times I'll see people and they'll say, oh yeah, like I have four pillows under my head and I watch TV. Well, that's putting you in a an extended position, uh, I'm sorry, a flexed position. Um, if you must watch in bed, um, sometimes I'll suggest using a wedge pillow. So your upper back is kind of slanted up and then you have a pillow, this one pillow for support for your head. So your neck isn't as flexed, but you're still a little more upright. And that's a little easier on your neck. Um, you know, same thing if you want to read and you tend to put multiple pillows under your head, something like a wedge might be helpful. Um, avoid cradling the cell phone against your ear or any phone against your ear for an extended long period. Um, it makes your shoulder and neck muscles tighten up. You can use a wireless headset. Now we have Bluetooth everything. Um, that easily solves that problem. And with a lot of the cell phones, just I just throw mine on speakerphone. All right. Avoid a prolonged time texting with your head looking down all the time. Um, change the position you're chest texting in or just text for a short period. Um, sleeping positions, when you sleep on your stomach, your neck has to turn all the way to the, to the side so you're breathing. Um, if you have issues with your neck or limited range of motion, that can be, become an issue. Um, so sleeping on your side or your back tends to be a little more comfortable for necks. All right, so now I'm just gonna move on to our to the home office now that we're in our COVID pandemic. Many of us are still working from home, um, which is not always the most ideal situation. And it all happened kind of abruptly. So it's not as though everybody had a chance to prepare. Um, here are some common postures or things we see with the home office. Um, the girl with the laptop on her lap kind of hunched over is really easy to do and I'm guilty of that at times. And then we have somebody working possibly in their bedroom with not always the best arrangement or holding the laptop and walking. All right. This is a picture of the perfect setup. And obviously it's hard to have everything perfect, but we're trying to minimize the the least <laughs> harmful things. So starting with your head, ideally you want your neck in a neutral position. You don't want your head all the way slumped forward and you don't want to be like looking in an extended position. So I want my head neutral. When I think of good posture, I'm thinking of my sternum aligning with my pelvic bone. Um, that my, I don't want my chest way forward or way back in those two relationships. Um, also my ears, kind of are over my shoulders. Again, that forward head would have that ear way forward. Um, so my neck is neutral. One of the things with eyes, and you're looking at towards like the top third of your screen, you don't wanna be looking down at a screen nor do you wanna be looking way up at a screen. Um, one thing to, to consider with eyes is if you're wearing bifocals um, or progressive lenses, one thing I notice because I do wear bifocals is a lot of times at the home computer, I'm like moving my head to see the screen. So that's one thing to be cognizant of, you know, am I neutral? Can I see clearly? Do I need to increase the font? Do I need computer glasses? Do I need to adjust my bifocals progressives so that I can see the screen clearly and not continually move my head or my, you know, my eyes up and down just 
closer and further to see the screen. Okay. If you have to be on the phone a lot, you want to use the headphones, the Bluetooth speaker phone, as opposed to holding it with your shoulder. The position of my elbows, I'm approximately 90 degrees, okay? Slightly more than 90 de degree bend or about 90 degrees, okay? And the chair is ideally adjustable, but most of us at home do not have an adjustable chair. We're kind of looking for a 90 degrees at the hips, you know, right angle kind of at the hips, but it can be, you know, it, it depends on a person's body. A lot of this depends on a person's body. If I have really tight hips, Sometimes when my hips are 90 degrees or slightly above, then I'm pulling in my lumbar spine. So that person might not want to get quite to 90. They may be more comfortable at slightly under 90. There's a lot of variables depending on a person's body type and structure. Um, when it comes to using the mouse, I want my wrist in a neutral position. Um, again, with my elbows at about 90 and my wrist is neutral. The keyboard should be the same height. Um, Again, with my wrist neutral, elbows bent about 90 degrees. A lot of times if you have to look down at a document, a document holder at the same height of the monitor is helpful. All right. This is just looking at the wrist position at the keyboard. So the one on the right is correct. Um, on the left, the person's a little more extended or a little too flexed, too down. Um, so somewhat of a neutral position. That's the least stress on the wrist um, and on the forearm muscles. Right. This is just showing your work area. So one of the things to consider, so the person is working with this white area is kind of the work area you want to be in. You, do, you want to avoid the corners of your desk because it just is a little bit too much reaching. Um, a lot of times too, it's with the, using the mouse, so we have the mouse in this area. If I'm using the mouse and it's way too forward on the desk, I'm always reaching, and that's a lot of like stretching to the nerves in my arms and tends to be irritating. So that kind of area right in front of you, that small, nice area is where you want to keep that mouse. This is just looking at features of an ergonomic chair. Ergonomic chairs are very adjustable and not there, you know, people always say, well, what is the chair you recommend or what is the pillow you recommend? And there isn't just one chair that's the perfect chair. It really depends on a person's body height, their type, um, their structure. I am, and you can't tell, but I am five foot 10. I have a husband that's six feet and my boys are over six feet. So in our house, all our furniture is really made for tall people. So when my mom, who's 90 and about five foot three comes over, I always have to put a pillow behind her on the sofa so because she'll just get lost into the sofa it's just too deep so adjustable chairs are great because you can adjust a lot of the things you can adjust the seat height you could adjust the seat depth you can adjust the angle the backrest height a lot of times they have, will have lumbar support sometimes that's an adjustable support the armrests at times are adjustable and so that's and you can tilt the chair so all those things are wonderful but we're soon going to talk about when you can't do all that all right, so we're going to talk a little bit now about working from home. Here's just some tips about working from home. So most of the time at home, we don't have the ergonomic chair. We don't have the perfect desk. Um, and sometimes, and many times, we're on a laptop computer that we've taken from work. All right, so if you have a desktop computer and can use it, um, alternate time between your laptop and your desktop. Desktops, you can set up more ergonomically correct. Just you can adjust the screen and adjust the keyboard. The problem with the laptops is the keyboard is attached to the screen. So when you get one to the right height, the other isn't. Um, so a lot of times if you can use a desktop, that's a little bit better ergonomically and more comfortable. Or um, if you are using your laptop, um, and I'm going to get that, you can use an external keyboard and mouse. Um, if you need two monitors, sometimes you can attach your laptop to your desktop and have two monitors, or I have had people that have used parts of one and, you know, and they're all connected. Um, if you are using a laptop, try considering putting the laptop on a riser. So that screen, you're looking at the top third of that screen as your eye level, and then have a separate keyboard and mouse um, with all the wireless options, it's, pretty, it's much easier to do. 
Um, consider a keyboard tray. I know in our desk at home initially, it had a keyboard tray and I put the monitor there and I kept the mouse up on the desk. And after a while that became a real issue because it was too high and I was in an awkward position and I was reaching too far and it was pulling on the nerves in my arm. And it took a while for me to kind of calm that down, but I moved that mouse down to the keyboard tray. Um, the keyboard tray can keep you at a better position with your elbows closer to 90 degrees. Um, your fingers should reach the keyboard home row and your wrists should be in a neutral position. And that's kind of where you're aiming. For your seat height at home, um, adjusting the height of your chair so that your feet are on the floor or on a footrest. Um, research has shown if our feet are dangling and not touching the ground, we use more muscle activity and are firing more muscles with them just hanging up there. So having your feet on something will tend to relax the muscles in your back more. So if your seat is too high for your feet to reach the floor, you can use books or a strong box under your feet or a footrest. Um, if the seat is too low, you can add a pillow to raise the height of the seat, okay? You're looking for approximately a 90 degree angle at your hips, okay? There should be two to three finger widths between the edge of your seat and the back of your knee. So you don't want the edge of your seat going into what's called your popliteal fossa with the back of your knee. Um, if your chair is too deep, you can add a pillow or lumbar support cushion behind you so that you're not sinking in. A lot of times if the chairs are too deep, and then when you relax back for the backrest, you're kind of forming a little C or just like sinking into that chair, okay? Lumbar support. Lumbar support is a good thing, especially if you're sitting for a long period. Um, the support is positioned slightly below your waistline, okay? Um, again, this sometimes in chairs if you're a very petite person. So most chairs are made for the average person. If you're really tall or really short, it doesn't always fit you. And so sometimes in some chairs, the support is not hitting the correct place. Um, so try to avoid extremely soft chairs or surface that you sink into if you need to put a pillow behind you. Um, and if you feel like there's no support in this chair, I'm like on my sofa, consider a, a lumbar cushion to give you that support. Desk and table height. Um, the average desk is about 29 inches high. Um, the kitchen table is usually higher than that. So if you're at the kitchen table, consider raising your seat to achieve the 90 degree angle at your elbows, and then you would most likely have to add a foot rest to get the hips at the appropriate height. Okay. You wanna move or change your position every 20 to 30 minutes and kind of walk around the room. Um, if you don't have an ideal workstation, consider spending time in more than one work area to limit that sustained posture. So, you know, you can spend a little time on the couch, but probably not all day. If you move around from one area, you know, of your home to another, sometimes that's helpful. I always tell people, um, there's nothing wrong with my finger, but if I hold my finger like this for one hour, my finger hurts. Our bodies are the same way. If we're stuck in a sustained posture for a long period of time, things begin to hurt because in that sustained posture, some tissues are on stretch and they're not getting as much blood flow and some tissues are shortened and they're not getting as much blood flow. So that tends to cause discomfort, just postural discomfort. So moving periodically is very helpful. Um, sometimes I tell people put a yellow sticky on your workstation and every time you see that yellow sticky, you remember, oh, I gotta move, I gotta get up. Um, now with iPhones and Apple Watches and all those things, you can set your phone to give you a reminder. You can have a watch buzz you every 30 minutes and you think, oh, I got to move. But just that sustained posture, you want to get out of that position. Also remember, every body is different. What works for one body type doesn't work for another. Um, if something's hurting, change it up. A lot of times, you know, when we talk about this is your great posture and this is ergonomically what you should do, not every body type is the same. There are some people that have scoliosis or skeletal changes. Um, if I am very kyphotic and I am, skele my skeleton is congenitally kyphotic, my head is gonna be forward and there's not that much I can change for that. And if I try to bring my head back, I tend to strain my low back more because I'm, extending way too far in my low back to get my chest where I think it should be. So you're doing the best you can um, to minimize 
the stresses on all areas and just you know keep in mind not everybody is the same and not everybody is perfect another thing i always kind of tell my patients your body's like a bucket everything that's wrong with you puts water in the bucket and as long as the bucket doesn't overflow you don't have symptoms your body is accommodating it can handle the forward head it can handle the tight muscle something comes along i have a car accident i fall and i you know land on the ice i have increased stress at work. I'm working extra long hours. Now more water's gone in my bucket. My bucket overflows and I have symptoms. And what we do in physical therapy is we look at the modifiable things and we kind of shovel some of that water out of the bucket. So in some people, there's always some water left. I'm not changing arthritis. I'm not, you know, but I'm looking at muscle strength and muscle flexibility and changing maybe postural habits in ergonomics so that I can shovel some of that water out of the bucket. Um, next, I just have a couple pictures of different things you can use. This is just a lumbar pillow. It's been around forever, um, common back support. When my low back is in the correct position, when I have support to my low back, my head and neck follow. If I'm really slouchy in my low back, I get this wonderful forward head posture. If I come in and just give my low back some support, my head and neck go into a much better position. So sometimes even for neck issues, that low back support can be helpful. Here are some, some cushions for tailbone pain. Um, tailbone pain sometimes is difficult for people um, or, any, or even pelvic pain with sitting. Um, you try to alleviate the pressure and again, depending on your body form and structure, um, different cushions work better for people. Um, here are some cushions that are available with different cutouts. This is commonly what you see for a tailbone pain. Here are some other um, cushions that give relief to the pelvic floor. This is a cushion that's adjustable so you can adjust the distance between the two pieces so that there is no pain on that tailbone area. Here are just suggestions for sleeping positions. Um, a lot of times when people don't have pain, they can sleep in any position and it doesn't seem to bother them. But once you do have pain, things seem to hurt. Again, it's that whole prolonged position for a period of time. Um, the two positions on the top are a little bit more neutral. So on your side with a pillow between your knees, when you have a pillow between your knees, um, it tends to decrease the pressure on your back because your leg isn't falling forward and pulling on your spine. So your spine stays in a more neutral position, less rotated, less side bent. Um, if you're on your back, a pillow under your knees is helpful. A pillow under your knees tends to take some of the weight from your legs off of your spine. So a lot of times if my legs are out straight, the tightness in some of my muscles and the weight of the legs tends to cause my lumbar lordosis or the arch in my spine to get a little greater. If I put that pillow there, it brings it more to a neutral position. Um, Cervical support under the neck. If I were to look at someone lying down on their side and I were to see their spine, I'm looking for their spine in a straight line. I don't want to see when I get to the neck that my head is way up here and my spine's going at an angle. This pillow size varies person to person. A very petite person will need a thin pillow. Somebody who's a large football player will probably need two because if I give them one pillow, their head's going to be sinking down this way. Same thing here. Um, you know, ideally we recommend one pillow under a person's head. But if you're very rounded through this kyphotic, you know, through this thoracic spine, which is called kyphosis, if I'm really rounded through that thoracic spine, if I only have one pillow, my head will be tipping back and extended, and that is not comfortable. So I want my head or my neck in a neutral position. I don't want my head tipping back. I want my head kind of neutral. So for some people, they will need two pillows under their head. This again, we talked about earlier, sleeping on your stomach is just a little bit harder on your neck. Um, sometimes too, it's hard on back. So if you are a stomach sleeper and you do have back pain, a lot of times we'll recommend putting a pillow under your stomach, again, to keep that spine in a more neutral position. 
When things don't hurt, they can go to end ranges of motion without much discomfort. But when people are in pain, those end ranges of motion, again, tend to feel more like this than that, like my pinky. All right, cervical pillows. There are all kinds of cervical pillows. And again, it depends on your body type and what's comfortable for you. This pillow here has like a little indentation and it has two sides. So depending on how you are built and the posture of your neck, you can use the thicker side or the smaller side. Here are just rolls that go under your neck. And this is a memory foam pillow that allows the, your head to sink in and kind of normalize that posture. All right, laptop risers. So laptop risers are very nice to put your screen at the correct height. If you don't have a riser, you can use telephone books or books to get it up to the, to the correct height. These are two pictures I took off of Amazon um, for laptop risers. This one's a one, the one where it's a little angled. The other one is just straight up and down. And here are some examples of footrests. These are also available on Amazon. Um, again, you can use telephone books or a box. Um, this one is adjustable, so it allows different angles and different heights. Both are fine to use. Um, so you want your feet to be reaching the floor, and if they're not, then a footrest is an option for you. There are also ergonomic keyboards, especially if you have hand and wrist issues. Um, they tend to curve to, um, to, put your, to put your hands, you can't see me here, but to put your wrists and arms in a more neutral position. All right, so lining is just another thing to think about at home. Um, if you're doing intensive computer work, you probably want lower light than if you're doing paperwork. Paperwork, you want higher ambient light. Um, you want you know, light uniform throughout your workstation. You want to eliminate the glare on the screen, so you don't necessarily want the light directly behind you. Um, set your monitor at right angles to windows and um, horizontal to long runs of overhead fixtures. Um, sometimes too, if the window's behind you, then you have that glare of the window coming in, which is difficult. To, I mean, well, in front of you, sorry, and the glare coming in behind your screen. Or if it's the other side behind you, then you get the glare the other way. Um, so that right angle to a window is helpful. And you can adjust the intensity of the lighting on the computer monitor. Um, I've noticed on some real sunny days where I have a lot of light in the room, I'm increasing my monitor brightness. And then on a really darker day, I'm decreasing that monitor brightness. You also want to decrease eye strain, anti-glare screens, you know, over the computer, um, and blue light blocking glasses. So a lot of people who are doing a ton of webinars, as opposed to meeting with people, are, are finding that the the light from the computer and the blue light glasses are quite helpful. All right, any questions? These are my two dogs in my <laughs> homework area, which is our bedroom. So I'm gonna stop sharing and- All right. All right. That was awesome. I learned all about the things that I'm <laughs> doing wrong. Um, so before we jump into Q&A, we have a lot of great questions. Um, I just want, thought it'd be fun to show um, a couple U.S. Pain staff members' workstations um, just so people can get kind of warmed up thinking about um, our different styles here. Can you guys all see my screen right now? I can. So I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. So so. Um, I asked um, our community to submit pictures, but no one really did. I think they weren't feeling brave enough to have themselves in the shot, which is totally understandable. Um, but on the left here, you can see our CEO, Nicole, and I think she definitely needs some pointers. Um, <laughs> we have Jose, our graphic designer in the middle. He's actually doing pretty well. Um, and then we have me on the right. Um, clearly, I need a hairbrush in that, that photo. Um, but I'm using some of the equipment you talked about, like the laptop riser. That's yeah, I noticed that. It's hard to see the laptop riser. So starting on the yeah. left, um, obviously there the screen is too low. So <laughs> for this situation, I would suggest putting her laptop 
on a riser so that the screen is the correct height and having an external keyboard and mouse. Mm -hmm. That would probably be the best. Yep. It's hard for me to see her elbow. Um, okay. You know, that, that angle you're aiming for 90 degrees, chances are that's probably a little too high. If it's a kitchen table, you might want to sit on a pillow or elevate your seat. But probably the, the for me personally, like having the keyboard and the mouse at the right height makes, is like the thing that helps me the most, <laughs> you know, out of everything. And then, then I try to get the screen at a better height. Um, but definitely that screen is low. So a riser might be helpful with the external keyboard and mouse. Um, yeah, yeah. The middle picture does look good. And obviously if he's a graphics person, he's on the computer a lot. Right. <laughs> Unlike the rest of us that are not on the computer all day, but are now stuck on the computer all day. It's, <laughs> their workstations are pretty good. The, the monitor looks good. I mean, the, you know, he has that a decent angle at his elbow. His wrist looks neutral. My only comment might be you want to make sure you're not putting pressure on the edge of the desk on your forearm. Mm. Um, so sometimes there are, well, not sometimes, there are nerves that will run through this part of your forearm. And if you go to the edge of a desk and put a lot of pressure there, it can irritate that nerve. Right. So that would be one thing to consider. Um, his feet look like they're just pointing down or plantar flex, but I'm assuming they can touch the ground. If they can't touch the ground, then a foot rest. <laughs> but all in all, it looks good. And he has a decent posture and the screen height. Um, I don't think that, you know, it, my one comment for your chair is that <laughs> <laughs> putting more pillows behind you might be helpful. Right, yeah. yeah. That's a deep chair. It um, is. Your heels look like they're off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so a small footrest might be helpful, um, but the, the screen height looks great and you have, you know, the external keyboard and I see your keyboard splits, which is hard for them to see, but I saw that in another picture. So that is probably better. Yeah. And if anyone's in, it's a split keyboards are cool because I have a lot of neck and shoulder problems. So it's basically, it keeps your shoulders more in a neutral position instead of kind of scratch, yeah. um, which I really like. Yeah. But yeah, thank you. So I thought, I thought it'd be fun to kind of, um, you know, show us in our, you know, okay, but sometimes not so great positions just to get people not feeling too bad about um, their own workstations because we, we all could do better. So um, we have a lot of questions I wanted to get to. Um, so one question that's come up in a couple of different ways is, um, you know, a lot of people with pain, you know, no, they have trouble working sitting upright. So some people um, are either like lying down on their computer or they might be standing. And so it's sort of a general question if you could speak to mm -hmm. um, things to watch out for in either of those positions while on the computer. So standing is a wonderful posture for the computer and they have standing desks. And I actually didn't include that because a lot of times, well, I wasn't thinking of that because I think of that as a work office kind of people have desks that go up and down unless you're working from home all the time and then maybe you do. Mm -hmm. um, standing is a wonderful way to work. Um, again, you would still want that same angle at your elbows or alignment so that you're not, you know, that same work area, not reaching way far forward to get to things. Mm -hmm. um, my wrists are neutral on the keyboard. That mouse is in a comfortable position, so I'm not, again, reaching way forward with the mouse. Um, and then the only thing, too, is when I think of good posture, I think, so people have a tendency when you say, oh, you know, good posture, they're like, oh, I need my shoulders back or I need my neck back. It's more like, I tell people, if you think of a string at the top of your head lifting you tall. So I am lengthening. I am not necessarily getting things back but I'm lengthening tall, like a marionette getting pulled. Um, you know, another way is almost like I'm pushing it, if I'm sitting, I'm pushing into my sit bones down so that my, I'm like lengthening. So when you lengthen, that tends to help your posture. And then the other thing to think of is if you think of your rib cage, which you can try to, but mm -hmm. your rib cage here, okay? My rib cage in, in, in neutral posture, in good posture, my rib cage is in line with my pelvis. It's over my pelvis. 
if I think of it as a bell, I don't want it rung up, nor do I want it rung back. So if I'm in standing, if I think is my, you know, is my rib cage over my pelvis and I'm in, in, in am I tall, like, you know, lengthening, like then that would be a good posture in standing. Sometimes too in standing, um, if people have back pain, a lot of times if you put one foot up on a stool, it tends to take some of the pressure off your back. So, you know, you, you would always say, oh, when you're in the grocery store, you're pushing the cart and they have that rail on the bottom of the cart, you know, put your foot up on a, the, the bottom rail if you have to stand in line for a long time. Or, you know, so just that, like a little foot stool, like putting your foot a few inches up on a stool sometimes can help too. And it can break up some of that standing if that's uncomfortable. As far as lying down with the computer, that is a tough one because I don't think there's like a great position. Obviously, you don't, if you're on your stomach on the computer, you're in like that arched position and that you can only do for a very short time. Um, if you're lying and the computer's on your stomach, you know, that again, you're probably in a C-like position and isn't always the greatest. Um, I guess you could try if you have, like if you're lying in bed and you have to lie down, you could be maybe on a wedge or if you have a hospital bed that it elevates a little and have like a, what you would see in the hospital, almost those carts, but the, you know, like one of those desks or tables that you could put in and maybe put it just to the right position and then you could maybe use that laptop a little better. The other option would be on your side. Um, mm. And I would then, you know, you'd want to be in a neutral position and uh, you'd have to maybe prop your laptop on something, a book or two maybe, I, to see, you know. Yeah, lying down is, is tough. Um, you know, and I don't know if it's helpful, but I actually do lie down quite a bit. I do. Um, but if you could see in the picture I had, so the two, the split keyboard is actually attached to a, like a two by, like a plank. And so what I do is I, um, I lay in like a, a gravity chair, so it reclines, and mm -hmm. then I have a laptop desk that rolls. And so I like, the laptop can come kind of over me while I'm lying back. And then the plank with the keyboard attached to it comes onto my lap. Um, okay. So you have to, you have to really get pretty creative, but, um, but it is, you know, it's, it's, and it's a little harder, um, but there are some, some options. All right. So let's, here and we're seeing a lot of people saying yes they do they, they lie down at the computer in their lap but I think like you said a wedge pillow or maybe some some supportive pillows um, and then maybe that the tables that you know that right you right. right um this one is uh, totally after my own heart because it's it's asking um for tips on how to stop crossing your legs so much while sitting and I'm super guilty of this so I don't know if you can speak to why we do that and how to prevent it? You know, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say that crossing your legs is a terrible thing, but you wouldn't want to stay that way the whole time. And it depends. So certain, certain conditions or certain pain conditions, um, crossing your legs may be aggravating. Like if you have SI joint dysfunction, something along that line, like that may be not what you want to do. Mm. Um, I don't know. Again, if you can have like a yellow sticky or a visual reminder, like every time I see that, are my legs crossed? Do I need to uncross? Or do I change the way I'm crossing them? Am I always crossing one way? Maybe I need to cross the other way. It's that prolonged position, like I'm taking my thumb and I'm holding it there. Mm -hmm. After an hour, my thumb hurts. So you just don't wanna be in that prolonged position. So again, I think the either the buzzing on like an Apple Watch or your phone timer or a yellow sticky mm -hmm. that is just like, oh, I'm checking in, you know, you know, what position am I in? Sometimes, you know, I'll I'll I give people an exercise they're supposed to do throughout the day. Actually, it's diaphragmatic breathing. And I'll say, like, every time you think what time is it, that's when you're doing your breathing. So again, like every time I think what time is it, am I in a good posture? Are my legs crossed? Do I need to uncross? Right. Any of those kind of are helpful. <laughs> um, and someone was sort of asking a follow-up to what you were talking about before, but it's along the same lines. Um, like why does l raising one leg help alleviate the pain when you are um, standing? Like, is it? So it, and it depends too on the person. So if somebody tends to have a, a sway back or be real archy, 
-hmm. Sometimes when you bend that, like when you put your foot up on a stool, like, oh, are you talking about lying down or standing? When you put your foot up on a stool, it's just bringing your pelvis maybe into a little bit more neutral position if you tend to have a big sway back or anterior tip in your pelvis. That's kind of, I think, where that logic comes from is I'm standing, I tend to have too much of a sway. If I put my foot up on a stool, it brings it more neutral. As far as the lying down part, if that was where that came from. Um, so the weight of my legs and some of my soft tissue tightness that so sometimes people tend to have um, tightness in their hip flexors, which is common because we sit all the time. Mm -hmm. So when I lie down, I have to have extensibility in the front of my hips because my hips, like for my legs to go straight. But if my hip flexors are a little tight, it'll tend to pull on my pelvis. And that pulling on my pelvis may arch my back a little. So if I have that pillow under my knees, mm -hmm. it takes that tension off of the front of my hips so it's not pulling on my pelvis. Got it. Okay. Got it. No, that's, that's very helpful. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in, so I'm trying to see here. And just so you guys know, um, Linda can't really answer like really super specific medical questions. So if you've asked one like that, I'm going to try to generalize it a little bit because obviously it's hard for her to assess you and, you know, know the full, you know, scenario with your health. Um, one question we got was um, about when this person does sit in good, with good posture or what they feel like is good posture, they feel like like things start to hurt, like their, the middle of their back starts to hurt or like their shoulder starts to hurt. Is that something that is just like your body's trying to get used to the better posture or like, what do you so, think? Okay. <laughs> um, good posture, if you think of that string pulling mm -hmm. or that is kind of more of a, I'm stacking, it's almost like I'm stacking my bones on top of each other. I'm stacking my spine. I'm stacking my system. And that requires less effort than actively holding myself in good posture. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to align and kind of, and it's not going to be perfect, but I, you know, I think, okay, my rib cage is over my pelvis. I'm lengthening or my, you know, sternum and my pubic bone are lined up. Um, and that I'm tall that may take less effort than I'm holding my shoulders back. Mm. Okay, so that might be part of it is that I'm actively working so hard to keep myself there that that becomes uncomfortable. The other thing that may also come in, when, if I have spent a lot of my time very rounded, just I'm picking this one, I can't quickly get here because all this soft tissue is tight and that doesn't change overnight. So modifying posture overall takes some time. So, so it's kind of like we, we're trying to, you know, align things, but fix things and then kind of live in that position. Mm -hmm. um, it's also, sometimes we've learned to hold ourselves certain ways. It's kind of like they say, oh, when people cross their, you know, if you cross your class your hands, some, you, some people have one thumb over and some people have the other. And if you switch your thumbs, it feels different, but it's not like crossing your hands with one thumb on top is better than the other thumb on top. But for me, like I have to have my left on top, like that's how I cross my hands. <laughs> so when you switch your posture or you're trying to change your posture, it's like switching that finger and it's like, oh, it just doesn't feel right. Or if it feels different. Mm -hmm. So some of it is I just have to learn to be in this new position and it is going to feel different and different isn't always bad. Right. Some of it is it takes time and the other is maybe I'm trying too hard to get there because if I'm trying and holding everything so tight, then that's not helping because my muscles aren't relaxing. Right. That is great. So like, you know, like with anything with chronic pain and health conditions, you have to be patient and it's about that kind of subtle mm -hmm. progress. Um, I'll just say one other thing. Yeah. Perfect. If something is hurting, maybe change the way you do it. Like, you know, if this position hurts, let's modify that. Because again, going back to like a person who's very rounded here, if I'm rounded here and I want to get my head back and I, I, I can't because this is just fused this way, just like, Mm -hmm. The only way I do it is through my low back. 
So mm. I'm thinking I'm in a good position, but I'm putting all this strain on my low back. So that's the other thing to consider is mm. what you're thinking is good posture. Is that putting stress on another area? Mm. And then maybe I have to modify that so that air, the area that's hurting has less stress, which maybe isn't what I think is perfect posture. But that just may be my posture. Right. To, to, to just kind of think. But be that. mindful of your unique situation and be yeah. patient. I feel like those are. Because we always say, like, <laughs> if you look at a chain, like a chain link, you know, with rusted, I have rusted links, and then I have a real loose link, and then I have a rusted link. When I pull on that chain, the, the part that gives is the, is the non rusted link, but my problem are the rusted links. So it's kind yeah. of like, Sometimes the area that screams isn't the problem. You know, it's the victim. It's not right. The right. Interesting. Um, so we're just going to take one last question because it's almost five of here. Um, I really appreciate everyone asking all these great, um, you know, different things and, and different um, concerns. Um, so, and I think this is one is a good one to close on, which is, you know, where do you suggest looking for, um, and they in particular were, were talking about um, adjustable chairs and seat cushions, but I guess it, it could apply to really any of the sort of tools you talked about. Um, like where do you suggest looking? Are there places online? Are there, you know, kind of terms you would search for? Um, um, it, there are places everywhere. I mean, I actually get a lot of things for patients through Amazon. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. oh, here it is. It's on Amazon. You can order it. It ships to your house. I mean, it comes quick. It's, you know, if you have Amazon Prime. Um, there's one website. And so, the, like, there's one website called, like, Cushion Your Assets that is for coccyx pain. They have a bunch okay. of cushions there. And, I, and that looks like a nice resource. I'm not plugging anybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I do look a lot on Amazon. There are some like physical therapy, medical sites, but that, that stuff is everywhere. So there's not really like, oh, this is the place to go. Um, there, I know like there's like the bed and back stores and they tend to be very expensive and mm. in, not always do you have to spend a ton of money. Okay. So, yeah, no, so I think, and just to recap, we talked about the lumbar support cushions or the cushions for under your, your butt and mm -hmm. um, for, you know, cosmetics pain or tailbone pain, laptop risers are another good one, ergonomic keyboards, I'm just reminding people sort of what to, yeah. what to type in. all on Amazon, not that I'm yeah. plugging the Amazon, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's simple. <laughs> um, yeah. um, well, if they use Amazon Smile, we get a little portion of the, oh, yeah. um, the purchase, so that's okay with me. Um, and then, of course, ergonomic chairs, looking for all those features that you talked about with all, basically, the, the more adjustable they are, the better. Well, one thing with chairs, I would say, is if you can sit in the chair. <laughs> right, right. Because, like, so that I would probably go to an office supply place or a back store. Mm, and just okay. buy them out because depending because they again chairs are made for the average person and if you are not an average height mm -hmm. and an average build things just don't hit you in the right place and you I think you really have to feel a chair right <laughs> in a chair you know right. cushions you can mail back you can take them you know keep them in the plastic use them for a day or two and like oh this did not help that can right. go back um but yeah you know, a chair, I think you really need to just try out. In, in and, uh, yeah. And trying to lug a chair back to the post office to send back to Amazon will probably do more damage. <laughs> yeah, that, I would definitely. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a lot of people saying thank you so much for your time. They found this really helpful. Um, so before everyone jumps off, I am going to just give you guys a few updates from US Pain. Um, so stay tuned. Stick around if you want to hear those about some events we have coming up. Um, but Linda, thank you so much. I feel like I learned a ton and I hope that everyone listening did too. Um, we really appreciate you and your unique expertise um, with chronic health issues. So thank, thank you. you so much. All right, thank you. All right, so I am going to just go through a couple things here. Um, just about some other stuff that we have going on 
for US pain. Um, so this webinar was done as part of our pep talk series. Um, so we have those every other month on the third Tuesday at 1 p.m. Um, our next one is um, to be determined <laughs> as far as a topic, um, but we're always looking for, um, you know, super timely, interesting speakers. So we'll keep you updated on that. But I also wanted people to know about a few other things we have going on. So one is our Pediatric Pain Warrior Virtual Retreat. This is a really, really cool program for kids with pain and their family members. And it is going on for um, like throughout the end of the year. So they have multiple events happening every month, um, including like informal um, support groups. They have different educational things directly geared towards pediatrics. Um, they are also doing different a lot of really fun things. So like different art projects and story time with Disney princesses, but it's a really cool program um, to sign up. Just go to their URL, their pediatricpainwarrior.org, and it is all free and there's even prizes for participating. So I cannot recommend that enough. And if you are not a child um, with pain or you know, probably not since you're listening to this webinar. Um, but if you don't have a child with pain, maybe you know someone who does and you can recommend it to them. And um, I also wanted to plug our Building Your Toolbox series, which is done through Pain Connection. The next event is gonna be June 2nd and it's gonna be on self-hypnosis. Um, you can learn more about that at painconnection.org. Um, those are really unique. They're not quite like a regular webinar. It's a smaller, more intimate setting. Um, where you can see and hear each other. Um, so that way you can kind of get to interact with the speaker. Um, so it's a little different, but if you're interested in that, definitely um, check it out and learn, learn more. Uh, also a reminder that Migraine and Headache Awareness Month starts June 1st. Um, May was chock full of awareness months, um, but Migraine and Headache will get some attention um, very shortly. And we have a lot of plans for that. Um, specifically a few different webinars that we're working out the details for. We're also going to be running an education, um, or sorry, an advocacy campaign um, for the states. So keep an eye out for that. We should have more information about that in the June 1st newsletter. Um, finally, I just wanted to give you guys sort of a preview of our virtual advocacy day on June 11th. Um, we're going to be doing a huge public campaign to flood policymakers with an ask about how to improve pain care for everyone in America. So please keep an eye out for details about both of those things. I also just wanted to say thank you to our corporate council um, for sponsoring so many of these events um, and allowing us the flexibility to kind of um, identify where we can help patients most. And finally, thank you guys for joining. <laughs> we really appreciate it. We're so happy to have you. And if you want to get news and updates about upcoming events and programs and action opportunities, um, please subscribe to our mailing list. That's the best place to get details from us. So thank you all so much. Hope you enjoyed this webinar and we will talk to you soon.